wonderful events and things in Jesus' life, especially. Listen, we could spend the rest of the year, we could spend the rest of our life studying about Jesus and never want to run out of amazing, wonderful things to look at and study. But notice with me, as we get into the Bible tonight, look with me in the Luke chapter 8, and we're going to begin our reading in verse 26, where this particular narrative picks up. And it says this, and they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, which is over against Galilee. Now, you say, well, where were they coming from? Notice with me, go back up to verse 22 to give a little context. And now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples, and he said unto them, let us go over into the other side of the lake, and they launched forth. So we understand that the, the lake is the Sea of Galilee. It was also called the Lake Gennesaret, all right? And you say, where is that? Brother, uh, Brother Brandon, why don't you go to the next slide, please, and uh, give you a little bit of an idea up there. And so the, if you look up on the, uh, the screen, you see the little body of water just to the very north of the land of Israel. Brother Brandon, go to the next slide. Kind of, We're going to zoom in a little bit here. And there's the Sea of Galilee. Uh, it's about 8 miles across and about 13 miles long. And he was coming from Capernaum. Capernaum is in that top north, uh, uh, top northeast. And they were going to come down to the area of Gadara, which is on the other side of the lake. So notice with me now how that makes a lot more sense. You understand your Bible geography. He says, now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into his ship with his disciples. And he said, let us, go to the, uh, let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And so they were starting in the northwest corner and going down to the southeast corner, uh, a journey of almost 13 miles. Now go back down with me in verse 26, and we picked up the narrative. And they arrived at the country of the Gadarenes, or in the area of the city of Gadara, which is over against Galilee. It's on the exact opposite side of the lake. And when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils long time and notice the distressing condition this man wore. It was in anywhere, no clothes, and neither abode in any house but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And notice this with a loud voice, what ha said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for oft times it had caught him. And he was kept bound with chains and in fetters. Now chains go about the hands, fetters go about the feet. So he was bound in chains about the hand and fetters about the feet. Um, and notice here, and these would have been iron, steel, and brass. And he brake the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. And Jesus uh, asked him, saying, what is thy name? Now he's not talking to the man, he's talking to the spirit inside the man. And he said, legion because many devils were entered into him and they besought him that he would not command them to go out into the deep uh, that is the abyss and and there as he was uh, and there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain and they besought him that he would suffer or what we would say allow them to enter into them and he suffered them in fact in the gospel of Matthew he gives one word go that was it. You say, how powerful is Jesus over thousands of demons? One word, go. That's all Jesus needs is one word. In verse 33, and when the devils, uh, then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine, we call them pigs, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. They all died. And when they uh, that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Then they, that's all the city people, went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed. No notice there. What happens when Jesus touches a life? Sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And my friend, what an amazing statement right there. And they also, which saw it, told them by what means he had, that was possessed of the devils was healed. Then the whole multitude of the country, the Gadarenes, around about besought him, that's Jesus, to depart from them. But they were taken with great fear. And he went up into the ship and returned back again. I love this passage in verse 38. What's the natural response when Jesus delivers you from self and Satan? Now the man out of whom the devils were departed besought him, means asked him, begged him, that he might be with him. 
Do you know the greatest thing that Jesus wants from your heart and my heart is simply to be with him. Amen. But Jesus had bigger plans and other plans for this man. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to thine own house and show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done for him. Can I just tell you this? What are we doing out at the fair this week? What do we do when we go out soul winning? What do the missionaries do when they go on the mission field? You know, it's real simple. Just go tell people how many great, wonderful, amazing things Jesus has done for you. Can I just ask you this? Has Jesus done anything wonderful in your life? Say amen. amen. Jesus has done more wonderful things than I can even count, my friend. I have, I have a lot to say about Jesus. Let's do this one. We pause. When we pray, we get into our Bible lesson tonight. Father, we thank you for this evening. Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage, this Lord recorded history in the life and ministry of our Lord. And Father, we ask you, Lord, as we would, Lord, look into this passage. Lord, give us the Bible truths, Lord, the, the truths, Lord, you want from this topic. Lord, help us to learn and Lord, help us to observe and God, help us to apply these truths to our life. And Father, I pray that we would be different and God, we would be better because of it. And Lord, we thank you, uh, Father, this evening. God, for your great love, care, and mercy. And Lord, we just ask this in Jesus' name. And amen. Now, when we get into the message tonight, I always like to give a little bit of an introduction on kind of where are we? Well, of course, we're in, the, we're in the New Testament. That's easy to understand. Some of the Old Testament ones, we had to kind of dial in where we were. But it's easy to understand. We're in the New Testament. We're at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He would have just been, uh, just been or had picked his 12 disciples, and they began his three and a half year uh, earthly ministry, and, and Jesus was going about, as the Bible summarizes it, doing good. And uh, now from Nazareth, where he grew up, and Jerusalem, where he would visit often, uh, Capernaum began to be the, the center of ministry. That's where Peter and Andrew lived, James and John, that was their city, and so several of the disciples were based around there, and so it would seem that Jesus' ministry base was there in Capernaum. And many times we'll see that the lake of uh, the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake Gennesaret, features prominently. Jesus used it as a transportation means. It was very prominent. They'd get in a boat, they'd go from one side to the other. And uh, these men were also commercial fishermen, very uh, familiar with the territory. Now, the second thing I, I want you to notice here is they were going, they got in at uh, Capernaum. They went to the area of the Gadarenes. We see that here in verse 26. So what was Gadara? Brother Brandon, if you'll bring up that next slide. Well, first of all, you say, what does the Sea of Galilee look like? All right. If you take a look at the Sea of Galilee, the, the rim sits very much higher uh, than the rest of the body of the water. Several hundred feet around it, it sits, and, and the water sits very much below the level of the top of the, the Sea of Galilee. And this is the source of the Jordan River, and it flows all the way down through Israel, past Jer uh, Jerusalem, all the way down to the Dead Sea. And, uh, and so this it would give a, a very, it's an arid place, it's a beautiful lake, I've had the opportunity to be upon it. And, uh, and most times it's pretty calm. But because of the territory, because of the elevation of the land, the winds will oftentimes pour over and it will cause storms to come up very quickly. We're going to look at that next week. Now, Brother Brandon, no, once they went across the Sea of Galilee, they came to the city uh, or the area of Gadara. So if we go to the next slide, please. So what's Gadara? Well, Gadara was the city on the southeast side of the Sea of Galilee. You saw that on the map. We're not going to go back. But it was a Gentile city. It would not have been a Jewish city. It lied outside of Israel proper, the Sea of Galilee kind of being a natural barrier along with the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Israel was on the west side and the people of Israel. But on the east side was primarily uh, Gentile cities. These were different folks, indigenous to the land. But Gadara was a popular place. It was a prominent place. It was also a prosperous place. It was there, it was right off the Sea of Galilee, it was a commercial place, it was a trade route city, it was also heavily fortified, it was a Roman outpost, it was a, a colony of the Greek Empire, it was really a center for Greek culture, then the Romans came and took over, and so it was kind of the city seat of that area, and so it was a political city, it had great pro prominence. And so that's what the, the city of uh, Gadara was, so you have a little idea of what that was. Now... Of course, the main focus we see in verse 27. Now, notice with me back in Luke chapter 28. And the first thing I want you to write in on your notes here, well, the, the first thing would be the city of the Gadarenes. The city of the Gadarenes. That's where Jesus was headed. 
Number two, we get to the topic of the study tonight, the, the tormented man. And we see this man in a pitiful condition. Now, by the way, if you're studying this passage, I want you to just take note, uh, in, in, make a note in there, that you'll find this in two other places in your Bible. Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 8, we're going to reference that a couple times, and in Mark chapter 5. And so if you say, well, this is fascinating, and, and it's interesting how that there are some uh, supplemental material in those two places. Uh, so Matthew chapter 8 and Mark chapter 5. Now when they get to the city of Gadara, or the area of the Gadarenes, notice here, it says in, in verse 27, and when he went forth to land, literally, Jesus is getting out of the boat. All right, how many guys have ever been in a little boat? How many of you guys have ever been in a little boat? All right. And, and you know that it's, it's always kind of sketchy when you're getting out of the boat and you're trying to get onto the land. The boat's rocking and people are trying to get in and out and somebody's holding the boat. So I want you to get in your picture. I want you to picture the lake, the Sea of Galilee. And I don't want you to picture the blue sky. And, and they just get there. The, the, the boat beaches and, and now they're getting out of the boat. And it says, and when he went forth to land, he literally just got on dry land. And uh, there met him out of the city a certain man. And notice his pitiful condition, which had devils long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. Uh, now, this man uh, was in a terrible state. Now, it's interesting. In the Gospel of Matthew, the, it records that there were two men, all right? Now, listen, don't, <coughs> don't choke on that, all right? Don't, don't go, who? But, but, but Luke says there's only one guy, but Matthew says there's two guys, there's something wrong. No. There's not a conflict. Listen, there's a compliment. All right? Anytime we come into Scripture and we see in one place uh, some details, some supplements that were added in one place, we understand God is adding to the narrative. He's filling it in. Now, in, in, in Luke and in Mark, the narrative focuses on the worst guy. The guy that was in the worst condition and the guy that went on to do the greatest uh, with what Jesus gave him. So, Listen, please understand, where the Bible critic will find a problem or a trouble, if I say it that, where the Bible critic will follow, find a trouble, you know what the Bible student will find? A treasure of truth. Every time you come across a place in your Bible and you're like, I don't understand, there seems to be one, this is saying this over here, and this is saying, listen, the Bible critic will, see, see, there's something wrong with the Bible. No, 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 there's not trouble with the Bible, there's trouble with you, pal, all right? You see, there's a difference. When you go to the Bible looking for, for, for errors, you know, you know God's written the Bible so that you'll find what you're looking for. If you're looking to find cause to pick a fight with God, God will give it to you. Because God doesn't care. God's bigger than your issues. But if you go to God, if you go to the Bible with faith, if you go to the Bible believing this is the word of God, listen, you won't find trouble, you'll find treasures. There's always wonderful treasures of truth in the Bible. Now, it's interesting, we find out this man, of course, we see here his condition. It says that he had been with devils a long time. He wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. This poor man is, is today, he would be probably diagnosed with any number of either mental or physical ailments. But Jesus pegs the problem, not mentally and not physically, and by the way, I'm not taking away from either of those, but Jesus pegs the real problem as spiritual. Can I just say, my friend, the real problem with uh, uh, America is not an economic problem. It's not a race problem. It's not a political problem. The real problem with America, my friend, is America is spiritually sick. If we understand, if we look at the, 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 just the craziness and the, the division in our country, my friend, it's because, listen, America has left God. America has walked away from God and godliness, all that is good and all that is right. And America is deeply spiritually sick. Now, notice here in verse 28, it says, And when Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And, and, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. Now, what we find here is the torturing spirits. What was the, what, what was the problem? The problem in this tormented man was the torturing spirits. It was the man was possessed by what the Bible calls devils. Now, we would call them in the common vernacular demons, okay? 
But the Bible refers to them in two ways. Number one, you see here in, in verse 27, it says devils. That means they were, th- th- that's because they follow the devil. Uh, that's because they act like the devil. And then if you go down and read a little bit farther, it, 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 it identifies what they, these are unclean spirits. Now, if you're taking notes here, you can write these, uh, a few references down. Uh, write down um, uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Where did, these, uh, where did these unclean spirits come from? Well, these used to be angels. In Isaiah 14, God reveals to us the fall of Lucifer, who was the covering cherub over God's throne. And when he fell in sin, he became known as, Luce, uh, became known as Satan and the devil. And then in Revelation chapter 12, write that cross-reference down, Revelation chapter 12, verses 4, and verse 9, we find out the truth that when the Satan led a rebellion against God, one out of every three angels in heaven followed him. You see, at one time they were holy angels or clean spirits. They were with God. They were the creation of God. And, and, but when they fell, listen, they became unclean spirits. They followed the devil. They, there is the big D devil, but these were little D devils. They were angels that followed and served the devil. And that's where these unclean spirits came from. Now, this is interesting. Do you know? Do you know that the devils know who Jesus is? As soon as Jesus stepped out of the boat, they recognized him and he recognized them. Now, notice who these demons said Jesus was. Look at it in verse 28. He said, what have I to do with thee? Jesus. They knew his name. Who is Jesus? Thou son of God. Listen to me, friend. Don't, please don't let anybody back you down. Even the devil and the demons know who Jesus is. He's not just a man. He's not just a prophet. He is the Son of God. And who is the Son of? The Son of God most high. Can anybody say hallelujah right there? Who is Jesus? He's the Son of God most high. Now, a little bit farther on down, look at verse 30. In verse 30, and Jesus asked him, now this, he's not talking to the man. Jesus is talking to the unclean spirit inside the man. He says, what is thy name? And he said, legion, because there were many devils entered into him. Now, a little piece of history, a little piece of history. In the Roman army, the Roman army, where you break it all the way down from the, the massive army down into brigades and units and everything else, the, the smallest group was called a cohort, all right, a group, a small band of soldiers. And those went up into a company, and those went up to a division, and the largest grouping of an individual grouping was called a legion, a legion of soldiers numbering at least 9,000. All right. So a legion of soldiers was a group of soldiers, grouping of different companies, individual units, up to companies, up to troops. And that was grouped together in a legion. And so they would send a legion to this group or a legion. We would call it in, in, in our military terms. Sometimes you'll read or see in the newspaper like the Navy sent the Ninth Fleet. And that's a group of battleships and destroyers and aircraft carriers. It's a whole group of soldiers and they'll send them to a different area. All right. And so a legion comprised no less than 9,000 soldiers. It began to be, because of the popular Roman culture, it began to be understood. If there was a big group of people, it was a legion. And it was a lot, all right, thousands. And so we get an idea of just what was the condition of this uh, man. He was possessed with hundreds, if not thousands of demons. Now, I want to point this out. Please understand, Jesus didn't ask this man or this unclean spirit his name because he didn't know. Jesus is God. Jesus is all-knowing. Jesus is all-powerful. Jesus is all-present. Listen, Jesus knows everything. He didn't ask for his knowledge. Listen, Jesus asked this question for our benefit. Jesus is revealing to us, please understand, that underlying underlying sometimes problems in people and cultures and countries is spiritual darkness. It's a reality. I know that mainstream uh, uh, media and even uh, medicine and even religion would like to scrub out demon possession or the existence of a very real devil. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, he's a roaring lion, he's our adversary. Listen, he's real, he's roaring, and he's a destroyer. And following and serving the devil are, de- are little d-devils, they're demons. Listen, it's real. It's nothing to mess with. 
It's nothing to go poking your nose. Listen, you don't play with Ouija boards. Don't go to seances. Don't get involved in the occult. Don't read a cultic book. Do occultic practices. Pagans and all those pagans, witchcraft. Listen, my friend, all of that has seeds of Satan in it. And it's real and it's dark and it's destructive. Please, don't under, please understand, the devil's not some little guy with a red suit and little, little horns and a little plastic pitchfork. That's the image he likes to purvey. That's the image he wants to put forth. Listen, he's harmless. He's just a joke. My friends, he is a destroyer. And the reality of spiritual oppression and darkness is very real. Can I just make this very prevalent, very, very personal, very applicable? Listen to me. As we look out at society and we see the proponents of evil. You guys have seen it, right? We see it on TV, news, media, your phone. You're like, how in the world did these people say what they're saying? How do they do what they're doing? Please understand, they're not my enemy. Pastor, why don't you rail on those liberals? Why don't you rail on, because listen, they're not the enemy. Listen, this man, the, the, the people in Decapolis, the people in Gadara, they thought this guy's a problem. In fact, he was a terrorizing problem. If you look in the Gospel of Matthew, it says everybody who tried to pass that way, he was fiercely antagonistic to them. As soon as they landed on the shore, they were trying to get to the city. They were trying to carry out business. Listen, he, he dwelt among the tombs. Imagine you're, you're going to your mom's, or your grandma's, or your, your uncle's funeral. You're trying to have a funeral. And here's this man that's just off. He's crazy. And he's just completely out of control. And, of course, no clothes and, and, no, and, and, and just beyond imagination. And so they kept arresting him and kept putting him in jail and putting him in prison. And listen, they thought, this guy's the problem. He wasn't the problem. Listen, he was a product of a spiritual problem. The enemy was not this man. The enemy was the devils inside this man. That's why Jesus didn't condemn this man. He healed this man. Please understand, there's a lot of people out there that are deceived of the devil. There's a lot of people that are out there that are deceived of the devil. Please understand, just because they have a different political association or affiliation, just because they espouse a different philosophy, do we agree with them? Say it with me. No. Do we support them? Say it with me. No. Do we join hand with them? Say it with me. No. But I don't hate them. They're not my enemy. You know who the enemy is? It's the devil who has deceived them, who has duped them, or can I just say that, who has employed them. Now, there are some agents of evil. Let's be very frank. There are some people who have bought on to the devil's agenda, and they're not deceived. They understand what they're doing, and please understand, they're in cohorts with the devil. They're not your friend. But understand, those people, they need to be saved. They need to be delivered from the devil. And so we see here this man's pitiful condition because of these torturing spirits. Now, go down to the next thing with me. We see the pitiful pigs. All right, the pitiful pigs. We get in here, we continue reading our, the narrative here. And um, now notice him in verse 31. They didn't want to be cast out into the bottomless pit, the deep. Uh, that is in uh, verse 31. Now notice in verse 32. And there was there, right next to them, and herd of many swine. The Gospel of Mark lets us know there was about 2,000 feeding on the mountain. Now, a lot has been made about this, but please understand, this was not a Jewish city. Understand, this was a Gentile city. These weren't Jews. These weren't Jewish herders. Uh, these weren't uh, folks that were trying to flout the law or get away from doing what God... No, these were Gentiles, all right? How many of you... These were folks just like you and me that enjoyed a nice BLT sandwich. How many of you guys like a nice BLT sandwich? Hallelujah. I like my... I'm glad I'm a Gentile. I can have breakfast sausage made... Of, I love bacon and eggs, amen? I like a nice pork chop. I, I, I like a nice, uh, 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 listen, I, I like just about everything. A nice smoked ham, all right, for Easter, all right? It was always the craziest thing. Why do we have Easter uh, for, uh, why do we have ham on Easter to celebrate a risen Jewish Savior? That always never made sense to me. Thank God we're a Gentile. Now listen, <laughs> so please understand, these were not compromising or sinning Jews. These were just Gentiles like you and I going about raising pigs for their, uh, so they could have ham and bacon and sausage just like you and I do. And so... We do know that there's about 2,000 of them. Now look at the story here um, in verse 32. And, and there was there a herd of many swine feeding on the mountain. And they besought him that he would suffer them or allow them to enter into them. And he suffered them. Again, I said in the book of Matthew, he says one word, go. 
Listen, there, there, and there went, then went the devils out of the man and entered into the swine. Now remember, there's 2,000 swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the lake and were choked. Can I just say this to especially every young person in here? The devil has one will for your life to destroy you. The devil has one plan for your life that's to destroy you. And when you go down the devil's path, it'll always end up destruction. Now it's interesting. If there were at least, if there were just one unclean spirit per pig, there was a minimum of 2,000 unclean spirits in this man. That's an amazing, at least at a minimum, probably many, many more. Now, and the Bible says here in verse 34, And when they that fed them saw what was done, they fled and went and told it in the city and in the country. Now we're going to get down here to the next thing, the terrified townspeople. But before I do that, I just want to pause. I want to pause and I want to bring us back. Notice here, go back with me in verse 22. Verse 22, and it came to pass on a certain day that he went into his ship with his disciples and said, let us go over into the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. Now in between there was a lot of trouble and strife. My friend, listen to me. These disciples were in the will of God and they suffered storms. Just because you're suffering a storm does not mean you're out of the will of God. Number two, I want to ask you this question. I told you a little bit earlier, the Sea of Galilee is about 13 miles across. If you've ever taken a 13-mile boat ride in a little sailboat, it takes a long time. Even if you had six disciples on this side and six disciples on that side and they were rowing, it takes a long... They didn't have the little Evan route. They didn't put on the Evan route, all right, and motor across the lake. It took a long time. When he gets there, he's met by two men, one in particular that we're reading about here. Jesus is done with him. Notice with me here in verse um, 37. When the whole multitude of the country of Gadarenes roundabout besought him to depart for them, for they'd taken great fear, and he went up into the ship, never even made it off the beach. Let me just challenge you with this thought. How valuable is one person to Jesus? How much time would Jesus invest in one or two pitiful souls? At least a whole day. At least a whole day. Now, it's interesting. I have a background in, in the meat market business. I worked on a farm. We raised, uh, 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 raised cattle. We also uh, processed hogs and things like that. And so, you know, hogs aren't cheap. Average hog, uh, uh, market hog that you would take and make bacon and ham and pork chops out of, weighs about 200 pounds. Currently, you would pay a, a, a $1.50 per pound for a market hog. About $300, give or take, in today's money. 300 bucks for every single one of those hogs. $300, to give or take, times 2,000 uh, hogs is six hundred thousand dollars how much is a soul one soul how much is one person worth to jesus it's worth jesus taking a whole day out of his life to invest in one it was worth his time to get up early in the morning and go across the lake I don't know about you, you can see I got quite a bit of sun sitting out the fair for a couple hours today, okay? And it's the Shekinah glory of serving the God at the tent, all right? Got my vitamin D serving Jesus. Now listen, it was a long, hot boat ride across that lake. It took all day. Listen, my friend, Jesus, you, you ask yourself, how much am I worth to Jesus? You're worth his time, and you're worth his treasure. Jesus understood this was over, over a half a mil, close to three quarters of a million dollars just to deliver two men. That's a lot. My friend, you are valuable to Jesus. Now we look at the terrified town folks, and, and we would say, what in the world's wrong with these people? All right? It says in, it, notice here, uh, in, in verse, the end of verse 35, and it says, uh, they went out to see what was done and came to Jesus and found the man out of whom the devils were departed. Now, what happens when somebody gets saved and delivered? Notice, he was no longer running. He was sitting at, Jesus, at the feet of Jesus. He was no longer naked. He was clothed. Number three, and he was in his right mind. And they were afraid. What do you mean? Here's a guy. This guy's been terrorizing your town disturbing every funeral, running people off. And here's the guy, he's sitting there. 
got his clothes, got clothes on. By the way, the closer you get to Jesus, the more clothes you put on. I'll just throw it out there. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. What are you going to do with it? He's sitting at the feet. Of, where is he sitting? He's sitting at the feet of Jesus. That's a great place to sit. The Bible says he was in his right mind. My friend, there's a lot of benefits to coming to Jesus. And that, you know what? It terrified them. They'd never seen that. Can I, can I just make a point here? Not everybody understands and not everybody appreciates the work of God. Not everybody understands or appreciates what God's doing in your life and in and through you. Your unsaved or unspiritual family may look at you like, what's wrong with you? It's a beautiful, sunny uh, uh, Wednesday afternoon in Michigan. Listen, we only have a summer this long. Why don't you go to the lake? Why don't you go to the golf course? Why don't you go have fun? Why are you going to church? Because listen, you decide to come and sit at Jesus' feet. Please understand, don't expect your unsaved or unspiritual family, friends, neighbors, or co-workers to understand or even appreciate the work of God. It may disturb them. They may look at you and go, whoa, what's wrong with that man? What got into that lady? Jesus. Jesus makes such a difference. And let's look at the PS on this uh, wonderful narrative here. Jesus is asked to leave. And you know what, by the way, when he was asked to leave, he did leave. That's something interesting. Please don't push Jesus away. He's a gentleman and he will. Brother Brandon, if you bring that last slide up, sir, the, the slide of the ten cities, thank you. Notice with me, and the Bible says in verse 38, and the man out of whom the devils were departed uh, besought him that he might uh, be with him, but Jesus sent him away. This is the traveling teller. It's the last point, the traveling teller. And Jesus gave him instruction. He says, return to thine own house. In, the, in, in Matthew it says, and to thy friends too. And show how great things God hath done unto thee. And he went his way and published throughout the whole city how great things Jesus had done unto him. The Bible also records for us in the, in the Gospel of Matthew that he went throughout all Decapolis. Now if you notice there, the Sea of Galilee, down towards the right, you see all those little names of those cities in black. Decapolis means ten cities. Deca is ten. Capolis means cities. Not only did he reach Gadara, his city, but the Bible says he went throughout all of Decapolis, the group of ten cities. And you can see all those ten cities dotted all over that map, my friend. Listen, it wasn't like going from Holland to Zealand. It was like going from Holland to Lansing and Holland to Kalamazoo and Holland to uh, Muskegon. This man became a traveling evangelist for Jesus. He was willing, ready, and excited to go everywhere he could and tell everywhere he, well, everyone he could how wonderful, great things Jesus had done for him. My friend, listen, let me just ask you this. Has Jesus done anything wonderful in your life? Then Jesus' instruction says, return to thine own house. Do you know where we start serving God? Do you know where we start being and becoming a testimony? It starts at home. It starts at home. It start, listen, it starts with the people who know you the best. Listen to me. In my family, most of them, a lot of them are, are, are passed away now, but I'm still redheaded Robbie, okay? I still have my precious aunt. She never calls me Rob. She doesn't call me Brother Rob, Pastor Rob. I'm still Robbie, all right? And they're still looking at me. A lot of my family, you're not allowed to call me that, all right? My grandma, who is in heaven, and my aunt, that's it, all right? Now listen, but these are the people who know you best. These are the people who see all the warts. These are the people that know the good and the bad. These are the people who need to see first. They need to see the transforming work of Jesus in our lives. Amen? That's a wonderful passage of the maniac of Gadara. Let's pause and pray. Father, we thank you so much. God, we thank you, Lord, what it is when you transform, when you touch a life, and God, when you transform a life. Father, we thank you. And God, I, I probably, Lord, I, I, I don't know of anyone that would have quite the same salvation testimony, but I'm so glad that Jesus delivered me from the power of Satan and even from the, even the chains of my own self. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me, for setting me free. Lord Jesus, thank you for the many great and wonderful and amazing things you've done in me and through me and for me. You certainly are a good God. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. Father, we pray and we ask, oh God, 
as we consider this message tonight. Father, I pray and ask, oh God, that we would understand that, God, each of us are extremely valuable to you. God, you care and you are concerned for each and every, uh, Lord, creature on this planet and creation of yours. And Father, I pray, Lord, as we think about folks tonight, Lord, scattered across this earth, and Lord, there, the Lord, and even right here in Holland. And God, we'd look at them and we would say, there is absolutely no hope for them. They're lost, they're undone, they're a mess. They may even be a maniac, demon-possessed, but yet no one, Lord, help us to realize, no one is beyond the saving grace of our great God. And there is no situation, and there's no infestation, and there's no problem, God, that you cannot solve. And God, there's no mess that you can't turn into a masterpiece. Lord, help us to get a hold of that. Lord, we thank you tonight in Jesus' name. And amen. We'll stand this evening with our heads bowed and eyes closed. A word of prayer as the instruments begin to play a verse of invitation. My friend, if you're saved, Jesus delivered you 